thank you. Um, I have good news and I have bad news. Uh, the bad news is, is I'm not an expert on this, uh, except that we use it a lot in the unit. We use CPAP and we use NIMV. But um, research-wise, um, I've done none in this area. Nevertheless, the good news is that I'm unbiased, so I don't have any bias, and I had a fresh look at the literature. And they wanted me to talk about pitfalls of um, ventilator and uh, devices that give CPAP and NMV. And there you go already. What are pitfalls? And what do you do if you're not an expert and um, you have to talk about pitfalls? You, know, you go to your colleagues and you ask them, what do you think is pitfall? We have 10 neonatologists in our unit. And um, three of them said, well, pitfalls don't know. I don't know any pitfalls of giving CPAP and IOV. So that didn't help very much. Five of them said, well, what I find difficult is when I read the literature, what do I have to believe about the advantages and the disadvantages of giving CPAP by a device or a ventilator? Um, and seven out of 10 said also, um, what we noticed with the infant flow driver or with the ventilator, with the variable flow, is that you, sometimes you, you have to give rather high flows to reach the CPAP pressure. And even then, if you give a high flow and you say to the nurses um, on the high care unit where we have infant flow drivers, I want to give a PEEP level of seven, and the next day you come back and you, they report you, well, we tried to give seven, but we only reached five. Some, it's very often that, that, that the flow, or I don't know, what, it's about 11, and max is 11 liter per minute on the infant flow driver. It's very often that it, they, they don't reach the, the, the CPAP pressure. So that was um, a pitfall for my colleagues. And, um, well, Seven also compl uh, mentioned complications, like uh, the, the distended abdomen, the pneumothoraces, and the nasotrauma. But those are complications. Those are not pitfalls. So I decided not to talk about that. Um, and I asked them, to, which one do you prefer? Because we use the Avia, uh, CPAP and NIMV, and we use inflow drivers in the high care unit. Which one do you prefer? And they all prefer the ventilator device. Um, that is, of course, a bit biased, but um, uh, I was a bit surprised by it. Because before we introduced Avia, we had the infant star, and um, we had the inflow drivers. And the nurses and doctors hated the infant flow driver. And then I came with the Avia and I needed short by nasal prongs and I introduced the Hudson prongs. They hated the Hudson prongs. And then they loved the infant flow driver because it's much easier to, to apply. So now they're very used to infant flow drivers and they don't want to throw, throw it out of the window. Let's first talk about what CPAP actually does. Well, it mimics expiratory braking maneuver. This is what infants do uh, at birth and also later on. Um, on the left side, you see a preterm infant of uh, 28 weeks. And still don't have a pointer, have you? No, I think we never OK. So I'm going to like this. Oh, yeah. It's no battery. It is out of the battery. Oh, I thought it's empty, but anyway, good. Yeah. So this is the mass pressure CPAP is given. This is the flow, inspiration, and then holds it in expiration. So inside of the lung, outside of the lung. And this is the volume going in and out. Um, what the baby does is that it takes a deep inspiration, then closes the focal cords, contracts its abdominal muscles, and holds it, lets a little bit of air out here and there, but holds it completely, and then does an expiration, and then immediately followed by an inspiration. So this is a way of the infant to preserve his lung volume. Not only the, 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 the breath hold, but also immediate inspiration, so not, no post-expiratory pause, just to prevent that too much air is coming out. This is a way how he defends his lung volume. And another way to do it, is doing grunting. It's exactly the same mechanism, except that they take a deep inspiration and then they 
close, almost close the focal cords, but the, uh, they increase the uh, uh, intrathoracic pressures by contracting the abdominal muscles, and it produces sound. That's the grunt. That's a low frequency noise signal. But it's also a way to slow down the expiratory flow wave. It's just a way how they try to preserve the lung volume. So when they are grunting, it means they're working hard to maintain their FRC. And actually crying is the same thing, but then it's a high frequency noise signal. So this is what CPAP does. So if the infant um, is working hard and it's grunting, you give CPAP. You give CPAP. Yeah. So what does it do? It mimics grunting. The effect is, is that it reduces the grunting, and some units say, uh, for example, the $100 million question is how much CPAP you should give, is um, they use the grunt. If the grunt disappears, that's the level of CPAP you use. Um, it reduces to be tachypneic also. Uh, they, 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 they allow themselves to have a post expiratory pulse again and uh, increases FRC and because you have a more uniform lung aeration uh, and more FRC, it decreases the ventila ventilation perfusion mismatch. Not only does that, it also splints the upper airways by pressurizing the airways. The, tendon, the airways are, have, uh, the pretums have, have very little collagen and have tendency to collapse and you splint them by the positive airway pressure and so you have less uh, apneas and also pl splints the chest, the chest is flexible and that's why you get off very often paradoxal breathing this is the, uh, the expensive word for it but uh, you get less ex uh, paradoxal breathing and they also said it stimulates surfactant production but I think what they mean is that because the baby is still spontaneous ventilating and that stimulates the surfactant production is that correct, Kaisha? Okay. So the CPAP effect is that it improves oxygenation and decrease, well, it improves gas exchange and decreases uh, the amounts of apneas, the obstructive and the central ones. You have a better compliance and it will reduce the work of breathing. They have less, to do less effort to get air in and out. So pitfall one, there is a turning point in CPAP level um, oh, hang on. That's better. So, um, if you have less surfactant, the surfactant prevents, uh, it, it, it decreases the surface tension and uh, uh, decreases the, uh, the lung recoil, the tendency of the lung to collapse, the alveolar to collapse again. If you have less surfactant, you need to give more PEEP. So you do that by grunting, or if, if the infant can do it, you give it by the machine, the CPAP. And um, that's good, but you reach a certain level that you give too much PEEP, and then you compress the capillary. And when you compress the capillary, then you get a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So there is a turning point. And then the big question is, where is the turning point? Um, that is if an individual per patient, we don't know. Uh, this is the animal experiment that's been done by Kelly Crossley. Uh, it's PEEP is given, and she has shown by the pulmonary blood flow, fetal and after birth, it increases with uh, giving PEEP because you get more uh, aeration of the lung, um, and it, it stimulates the pulmonary blood flow, but above eight, it decreases pulmonary flow. So there is a turning point. I'm not saying that eight centimeters of water is in every infant a turning point, but it depends if, uh, uh, if you give it for apneas, you have to give lower CPAP level for healthy lungs than in uh, lungs that are uh, less compliant. The CPAP devices. Um, there are different ways to divide them. Uh, this is the way I did it. Um, the ventilator that can give CPAP and the CPAP devices. And the ventilator can divide by giving constant flow, and that's how it works with flow opposition. It's a valve control. That's the old baby log and the infant star does that. So it's a constant flow. Even if the baby requires more flow by inspiration, then you get some flow starvation, so that's a disadvantage. And also if you breathe out, you breathe against the flow, and you get an increased work of breathing. Uh, 
theoretically. Friable flow is that it, 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 re, it responds to the, the, to the demand, uh, so the, the, the files are server, con server controlled, <coughs> and that's what our VIA does in the VM500, that is the baby log, not the VM500, in the server I. These are examples. Then the CPAP device, can you divide between constant flow and variable flow? Constant flow is the uh, conventional way. I don't think anyone else, uh, this has been abandoned. Most of you use or CPAP, uh, bubble CPAP or uh, the Fluidic Flip. That's the, the, the Infoflow drive, Medijet, Arabella. And has different mechanisms, the liquid seal and the Fluidic Flip, we'll come back to that. So these are the, the options you have. Did I forget any, any device that you use? The Loni Plus, that's a ventilator. And has it variable flow? It has fluidic technology, so, oh, okay, and sorry. And the Stephanie. The Stephanie, okay, these are, were just examples. <laughs> there are many ventilators and there are much more uh, CPAP devices. The funny thing is, is because I don't, I have these examples from, uh, from reviews and the Stephanie is not, never mentioned and also the Leonie Plus never mentioned, so there's work to do for you guys. Pitfall 2, that's what my colleagues mentioned, how to interpret the literature. Um, most of the studies have been performed with, with small numbers. And these are the, the, the studies that have been performed with the ventilator versus the inflow driver. And these have shown positive effects to the inflow driver. Less CPAP fluctuations, fewer days of oxygen, sh uh, shorter duration CPAP, and uh, lower work of breathing. Again, these are small trials except this one. Also, versus bubble, ventilator versus bubble are small trials except the Tagawa one, and as shown that the bubble uh, CPAP goes less intubations. So if you look at the overview, you would say, well, inflow dive is better than a ventilator, and um, the bubble CPAP is better than the ventilator. The problem is, is that these studies, if you read them carefully, there are different methods, different patients, uh, different outcomes, uh, different units. Uh, there are all kind of variables that will influence the results, so it's a very difficult to, to, to interpret and to say what's really true. Peter Davis and De Paoli uh, tried to do it with the Cochrane Review in 2008. I, I tried to find an update, but uh, I'm not sure there's no, there's no update. They have given up, I think. Um, they, 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 they tried to do a meta-analysis, what well, they did, and to see which device is better. And the result was is that for the, de the, 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 the pressure generation, so the devices, it was uh, no way they could tell which one was better because of the different uh, designs of the included studies. Uh, they could tell us that the short by nisoprom is more effective because this is not the subject of my talk. Um, so the short by nisoprom gives less resistance than uh, a long or a, a nasopharyngeal tube. So still there has to be de determined which one is the best device. The other thing what I realized when I was reading the literature is that um, you read all the, uh, the, 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 the studies about the ventilators, but these are the ventilators with constant flow. And now all these modern ventilators have variable flow uh, to give CPAP. I give them some examples, a VIA and VN500. And Jacques did a study, and he compared a variable flow ventilator with the, uh, the bubble CPAP, and then he see, see no difference in failure of CPAP. Um, so, Apparently, it makes a difference if you use a constant flow ventilator or a variable flow ventilator, but then he mostly included uh, more term inf or more or less preterm infants that have more wet lung than RDS. Then, if you compare the inflow driver first, the bubble CPAP, um, no, there is getting in confusion. One said it's better, the, the bubble is better than the inflow drive, and the one says, the, the, the inflow drive is better than the, the bubble or they have no differences. And there are no meta-analysis. 
and uh, still has to determine which one you have to use. Pitfall 3. Does it work as they say it works? And um, I, again, I'm not an expert, but I was getting intrigued by the infant flow driver, uh, driver, how it worked, because it, it, this mechanism is really already uh, used years in, in, uh, uh, for airplanes. This is how airplanes fly, uh, the, the, the Bernoulli effect and the Coanda phenomenon. I never realized that until I was reading the literature about Infoflow Drive. So what does it do? It, 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 it gives a yet of flow, and because it's the yet of flow, so it's a small entrance, uh, the, the flow is increased. And because the flow is increased, and the Bernoulli, uh, the uh, equal of energy, how do you say it? The, the energy has to be equal, if the flow is increased, uh, the pressure. Uh, if the flow is increased, the pressure decreases, and then it reaches the nozzle, so where the patient nose is, and then you have a large area, and then the flow decreases, and then the pressure increases because it has to be equal. And not only that, uh, when the patient takes an inspiration, this is the expiratory valve, so this is the expiration tube. It's open to air. He's allowed to pull more flow, more air in, than what the flow is given. So it will give you a more stable CPAP pressure. And during expiration, and that's the Coanda effect, the fluidic flip, that's what you observe if you pour tea in a cup, and uh, there's always some drops coming from out of the... the that. What's the that? <laughs> from the tip of the... yeah. So yeah. the dripping, that's the corona effect because it ha has the tendency, the, 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 the particles that, that goes beneath the surface, it's slowed down, has the tendency to, to follow the surface. This is how air conditioning works. Um, this is how uh, airplanes work. Um, they used it, uh, this was a mechanical engineer or a student from Cambridge or Oxford, I forgot, um, who invented the inflow flow driver and uh, he won a prize with it and then of course there's a company who bought his device or the, 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 the idea and they become very rich with it. Um, but it's, it's very old, this is only what I'm trying to say. And the fluidic flip is the, so that during expiration there's a pressure increase and due to the pressure increase here um, immediately the angle of this immediately you get a flip of the inspiratory flow. So the patient doesn't have to breathe against the flow and it really helps you, it helps the patient to, to, uh, to exhale. So they call it an active expiration, which I think is a misnomer. But so it gives you stable CPAP pressure and uh, it should give you less work of breathing. So this is how they tell you it works and it, it really works in, 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 um, uh, on, on the bench tests. But then, if you look also, this is a bench test. Uh, Angela Cripps and Martin Wall did this, all kinds of uh, CPAP devices. And these are the devices that have the fluidic flip or the, the, the jet flow. And um, you see that there's less resistance in the infant flow driver. And the funny thing is they used also the MediJet without a sound absorber. Because the problem with inflow flow drive is not a problem with the noise, it, it makes a lot of noise. So they invented a sound absorber. And they didn't test it on the inflow flow, but on the MediJet. You can see if you use a sound absorber on the expiratory uh, tube, it will increase your expiratory resistance. But anyway, so it showed that it has less expiratory resistance in a bench test. Then in infants, Courtney did this, the work of breeding, it's often quoted. And uh, she compared. Uh, constant flow with variable flow. And this is the variable flow work of breeding and it's the constant flow. You can see there's a difference. There's less work of breeding if you use the variable flow and so you use the infant flow driver. But if you read the methods closely or more carefully, they say uh, when necessary the infant mouse was closed gently during data collection to stop any air leak and data with air leak at the mouth were not used. So this only tells you that the fluidic flip or the less work on breathing only works when there is no leak. 
And I don't know about you, but I think there's almost always leak because the babies breathe out to their mouth, even if you use a mouth trap. And that's been shown in studies, even if the mouth trap is used, there's still leak. So we're not sure if it works, you get less work of breeding if there is a leak. And what supports this is a study that has been done by Colin Morley. He measured the pharyngeal pressure. So he put a catheter in the, no, uh, in the nostrils and he was interested, okay, this is the number on the device we want to give, but what, what are we actually giving in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the nasopharynx? And they observed that the, 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 the pharyngeal pressure was much less uh, as we expected. Um, than what the, the CPAP level was. And you can see that uh, uh, closed is higher than, than, pa uh, than passive, so when the mouth is open. Uh, you even have a very low uh, CPAP pressure. But if you have the mouth closed, so you reach an average of five centimeter water instead of the set of eight. And they never observed an increase of CPAP pressure during expiration. Because if the baby would breathe out through the nose, if the mouth is closed, you should see it's, uh, an increase of CPAP pressure. You should see an increase in flow. And they didn't observe it. So that made them conclude that babies are unlikely to expire to the CPAP device. They expire to the mouth. And it's the same thing what I observe if I do recordings in the delivery room and there's a nasal tube used. And you, you close the nostril and the, and the mouth. And still you get, air, uh, you get flow in, but you don't see any flow coming out because you miss it. It's going through uh, out of the mouth. So we're not sure if uh, the fluidic flip works. It still has to be shown that it really works in the patients in the clinical setting. The IVIA, which we use, well, as already said, is server controlled. Um, there's a leak compensation by flow until 50 liters per minute. Uh, you can monitor. Uh, uh, the problem is, is you do the pressure monitoring in the device, so there is some delay and a reduced responsiveness. And there's a max of 10 centimeters of water. Um, they will give you an alarm when there is disconnection. Sounds good. That's what I always thought. But when you close up, sir, uh, I made a recording of an infant. This is just a, at random kin, uh, infant that was on CPAP in the, in the unit. So the set is eight, it receives a seven, and you see there's a fast response on the flow, but even that, the maximum flow setting is already reached, and you see the CPAP pressure just decreases. You see it already decreases here, and then the number comes later. So this is also not ideal, but this is, this is real life. This is what happens. Yep. Bubble CPAP. They tell us that the advantage of bubble CPAP is because of the bubbling, you get oscillations. And these pressure oscillations is beneficial for gas exchange. Um, so you need to have the bubble. If, if you have bubbling, you have the CPAP pressure reached. If you have leak and there's no bubbling, you also don't reach the CPAP pressure. So is it true that uh, the pressure oscillations are beneficial for gas exchange? Well, Courtney asked herself, these bubbling we observe, does, do they reach the patients? And they did a, a respiratory trace, rib bands, and they showed that um, this is the bubble CPAP, and this uh, the, the ventilated CPAP. And these are the oscillations. And these are the oscillations measured by the respiratory trace. Oh, hang on, sorry. But these are the oscillations by the respiratory trace. And you see there's no difference in oscillations. So whatever the bubbling is there is not really equal to the bubbling in the lung. We can't show it. NIPV as an IPV, what does it do? Well, we actually don't know that well. We're just starting to understand, or we, they, they start to understand what was actually happening. Um, NIPV, so just 
non-invasive ventilation, uh, singularized or not. It re gives recruitment of ELI with pressure change, higher tidal volumes, minute volume, chest wall stabilization, less work of breathing. There's no decrease in inflammatory response and it reduces apneas. This is just what you read in reviews. You have different devices, and I'm not going to ask you again if I forget any devices, but uh, examples of the ventilator is that the baby log, uh, well, the, the, the new baby log will give you variable flow before that was uh, constant flow, synchronized, uh, the IVIA, and another example, CIPAP, but that is not really NIPPV, that's BiPAP, it gives two different CPAP pressures. And uh, you can use uh, the InfoFlow driver for BiPAP and NPPV. If you read the literature, it's getting confusing. Uh, the red ones have shown no differences. And I would just want to point out, again, these are small studies, but uh, these are the larger ones. Uh, Kugelman showed that NPPV gives less intubation for RDS, but menaces. 200 infant, there's no difference in intubation for RDS. Then Ramadan showed NPV, there's less intubations. Again, different methods, different way to do it. Um, there are some meta analysis. In 2012, three trials were included, less intubation for RDS. So I'm talking about NIPPV, not synchronized. Uh, two trials reduces apnea, three trials reduces extubation. So it has some advantages. Um, it will, it can help. If you look at BiPAP, um, small studies, no difference. BiPAP gives better cost exchange. BiPAP has shorter support, oxygen in the hospital stay. And again, BiPAP is not the same as NIPPV. BiPAP is a long inspiratory type, 0.5 to 1 point seconds, so what's commonly used with low cycling rates and less than four centimeters of pressure difference. Then the NSNIPPV um, looks beneficial, less extubation failure, less, less, less work of breathing, less PPD, less extubation failure, less appear, no difference with NIPPV. So it looks like the synchronized NIPPV would be the way to go. Then Keir Palani published his study the problem is, is that he put it all together. So all these units were allowed to use BiPAP or SNIPPV, NIPPV, and uh, first CPAP. And he showed a large study, about almost 500 infants, no difference in BPD of death, the, the important outcome. So the analysis says there's no long-term benefit. So what should we do? You should read the literature. Well, first again, does it work as they say it works? NIPPV. The real expert about NIPPV and SNIPPV is Louise Owen in the Royal Women's, and uh, she did some studies. And um, she observed these are infants with a separate pressure of 20 centimeters of water, these are 25 centimeters of water, that most of the time uh, they didn't reach the pressure, what was intended and uh, only 12.5 were pressures above the step pressure because the baby was exhaling during the NIPPV. So it doesn't really reach the pressure as what you said. Um, this is also a study from her where she uh, observed uh, what happened during breeding and during apneas. And um, during breeding, she had the Grace capsule and the respiratrace. She saw no effect of the NIPPV. There's no differences. And during apnea, she observed that only 5% of the inflations, there was chest inflation observed by the uh, respiratrace. So apparently what we are giving is does not reach the lungs. And that's probably because the babies have a glottis. And they close the glottis and they do what they want. Then she did, because the studies, some studies have shown that there, there is a, benef a benefit. Maybe the benefit is because you increase the mean airway pressure, you increase the CPAP pressure. And that's why she compared in a, uh, in a, in a small trial with 10 infants, randomized to 30 minutes of NIPPV, and then to high CPAP and then standard CPAP. 
And then as you observe, there's no differences between the high level CPAP and the NIPPV. Um, there was less time with saturation below 80% of high level CPAP when compared to NIPPV, but then uh, non synchronized NIPPV, you had fewer and shorter apneas. So apparently, what the message is is that um, what we are doing with NIPPV is increasing the mean area pressure. So it could be possible that just increasing the CPAP pressure would do the same thing. Then, from Amsterdam, Antofakam and Midema, they were interested in uh, BPAP and they did EIT, electrical impedance tomography, and uh, also respiratory trace. And they showed, they did also a crossover, so they could start at CPAP, then BPAP level, 20 centimeters above 6 centimeters, and uh, CPAP. And um, they did observe and on a small increase in the end, end expiratory lung volume when measuring with the EIT, but not with the respiratory trace. That's correct. Or is it the other way around? It's all the way around. So the respiratory are the rib bands. Uh, that's uh, inductance, and uh, if you give an inflation, then the inductance changes, and you can measure it. And the electron impedance tomography, uh, that has something that Anton has to explain, but two different ways of, uh, of measuring it, and in one way you measure an increase of inspiratory lung volume, but there are, and also uh, a higher tidal volume. So the synchronization, there, there is a difference if you synchronize it or not. This is what Bengalari did, um, just to show you that uh, when you do uh, synchronize, uh, it gives you less work of breathing. You see that uh, there's no peak in the uh, positive pressures during synchronized ventilation. while when you're doing NIPV, sometimes the, 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 the esophageal pressure increases. So, um, but when you compare it clinically, no difference in tidal volume, minute volume, in a gas exchange. But there was less breathing, breathing efforts. That's what I, he has been showing here, doing synchronized NIPPV. So it looks like if you do an NIPPV, you should do it synchronized. Uh, synchronized, uh, you use the Crazy capsule, and uh, it works fine until there's a high, fr f high breathing rate. Uh, then it doesn't respond that quickly. You see if the, you have a high, high respiratory rate of 72, 40, 80, 40, 96, it doesn't respond that quickly. And uh, that's the downside because the most infants who need it have a high respiratory rate if they have RDS. So the crazy because it works fine until you have a high respiratory rate. So um, that was my adventure through the literature of CPAP and IIPPV. And um, I tried to summarize what the pitfalls were. But the first pitfall is the literature. <coughs> Uh, if you only read the abstracts and the conclusions, uh, you might get make the wrong conclusion for your unit. You have to read the, the studies carefully and interpret them. Sounds like an open door, but it's there. And um, if you read the liter literature, which device to use, I don't think there's, uh, there's any advice you can give, but I will come to that. And the other pitfalls, the baby have mouth and nostrils, so they can leak. And if it leaks, you don't have a fluidic flip. And if you have leak, you have less CPAP pressure. That's a pitfall. And the other one is with INPPV, the babies, and also doing CPAP. Babies have a glottis, and they close and open the glottis when they want. So it's not really tr uh, the case if you give an uh, inflation doing an NPPV that it also reaches the lungs. Which device to use? Come to that. Um, should we give NIPV or just increasing CPAP level? I think more studies have to be done. I think a large trial needs to be done. And um, if you give NIPV, probably the way to go is to give synchronized. But which device to use? Well, Colin Morley um, read an editorial for one of the randomized trials. And this was his conclusion about all the studies. That the conclusion seems to be that it doesn't matter which CPAP device you use. Um, 
And he considered that as good news because then you can use the device you're most experienced in, what the nurses find easy to use, and what's the cheapest one. And um, I think he's right. Thank you. I think you left. It is, frequently claimed, it is frequently claimed that different CPAP devices have a different tendency to blow up the abdomen. What's your view on that? That's a complication and I decided not to talk about complications. So um, I can only tell from my own experience is that uh, some babies get the standard abdomen with, with a, a sort of CPAP pressure. And some babies with the same suppression don't get a standard abdomen. And um, it must be that they swallow air because the, 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 the pressure of the esophagus is much, uh, the, the opening pressure of the esophagus is, is much higher than the CPAP pressures we give. So I think, you ask my opinion, I think because they swallow, and they swallow the, 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 the large volumes of air into the abdomen. But I, I don't have, um, find any literature that shows that one device gives more distended abdomen than the other, but uh, have you? Good. <laughs> so can I ask you how many of you uh, use uh, a separate CPAP device? So almost two thirds at least, I think. And the rest of you use the CPAP from the ventilator. Good. I think we have a question over here. Uh, we used to talk uh, of premature patients when we talk about uh, CPAP, but I, I would like to know um, what pressure you use uh, when we have a term baby uh, with a typical uh, transitory resp uh, respiratory distress syndrome for, for the very first 24 or 48 hours. Not to have, um, we used to have a lot of uh, pneumothorax at the very beginning of the use when usually when the baby cries, when he is uh, very awake. So your question is, which CPAP level should I use with babies with wet lung? Yeah, the pressure, because we, we talk about uh, yeah. higher pressures, but it seems to me, in my experience, seven or, or seven millimeters uh, of pressure in a term baby, it, it can be a lot. Well, um, we don't know what pressures we should give, and uh, I think you should, uh, what I would do is, uh, if, if there's oxygen need, I would titrate the CPAP pressure based on the oxygen need. Um, I would start with five and see how it goes and go up until eight. We use max of eight. Uh, the pneumothoraces is a different story. Uh, yes, they have a lot of pneumothoraces and CPAP also increases the risk of pneumothoraces, but also ventilation increases the risk of pneumothoraces. And also they can uh, create the pneumothoraces spontaneously by creating uh, very high pressures at birth, so um, I would start with five and titrate it up until eight, but um, that's what I would do. But you can't, you can't base on literature or on studies to say this is the number we have to use. And I think again, it's, 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 it's a personalized medicine. You have to approach the patient individually and see what he needs. So if he's still grunting and he's still working hard on CPAP 5, perhaps you give, have to give some more. And there's always a risk of pneumothoraces. But also if you give less CPAP pressure in a baby with RDS, uh, RDS also RDS is a, is, is a risk factor for, for pneumothoraces. So in your opinion, Adrian, uh, if, if this discussion is about devices, is there a difference between devices? How high you would like to go in pressure, in terms of pressure stability, or, I mean, there's... Based on literature, no. No, 